Go ahead. All right, yeah. Thank you for the introduction and uh, good morning, good evening, or good afternoon, everybody, depending on where you are. Uh, really thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, so I just want to make sure that uh, you all can see the screen here. Yes, perfect. All right, and everybody can just mute themselves because I hear some echo here. All right, perfect. Um, so I will just start here with a quick self-introduction uh, before we get into the presentation. And um, as many of you know, uh, I am Sudanese, so I come from Sudan in Northeast Africa. Uh, but actually I was born in a city named Abha in the south of Saudi Arabia. And then at the age of 12 years, I moved to uh, the capital of Sudan, Khartoum. And that's where I had my undergrad degree at University of Khartoum. I studied civil and environmental engineering. And then after I earned my bachelor degree in the uh, fall of 2016, I moved to Irvine to start graduate school. Uh, so since then I had uh, my master's degree and today I'm, I'll be defending my PhD. And then soon I will be starting uh, the next journey with Berkeley Lab as a postdoctoral researcher at UC Berkeley. Um, so this is a quick self-introduction. Uh, but today I'm really going to be speaking to you about some of the research work that I've been doing over the last four years and a half of graduate school. And during my PhD, I was very fortunate to work on a vast array of projects. So broadly speaking, my research interests fall within two main themes. The first theme is concerned with application of data mining and causal inference methods to address a variety of research questions in hydrometeorology. And at the first part of the presentation, I will share with you four studies that relate to this theme. The second theme is influenced by the type of research that we carry out uh, in our research group at UC Irvine here, namely estimating precipitation from satellite observations. And toward the end of the presentation, I will share with you two studies that belong to this team. So overall, the results that you're gonna see today uh, have been reported in six papers. Five of them have already been published uh, and one is currently under revision. And although these two themes might seem to be independent, uh, there is actually a common thread. So oftentimes um, a tool or a software that has been developed in one study has helped in another. So with that in mind, uh, I would like to launch the first part of the presentation talking about data mining and causal inference. So to begin with, um, in environmental systems, in hydrometeorological systems, more often than not, we have time series observations of different variables uh, that we think belong to the same system. And if we know nothing about the system that generated this data, then ideally we would like to extract as much information as possible from these observations on the dynamics of the underlying system. Um, so the most fundamental idea of causal inference is to use these observations as an input to a causal inference algorithm. And the algorithm will output a causal network in which nodes represent variables and edges represent interactions from one variable to another. So I would like to point out here that this is perhaps the simplest form of causal networks because causal networks can also have weights assigned to their edges. Um, and there is also so much that goes under the hood here, uh, which unfortunately I won't have enough time to discuss today. Uh, for instance, there are a variety of causal inference methods and these methods have different assumptions. So I spent quite a lot of time of my PhD uh, trying to examine how the performance of these methods is impacted by the assumptions encoded in them. And what is the role of sample length and process and observation and noise and so forth. So this work resulted in some theoretical insights 
on the performance of different causal inference methods. And much of it has been reported in a paper that came out last year in Water Resources Research. But what I would like to show you here is an example that illustrates the use of causal inference and also serves as a proof of concept. And the, uh, this example has to do with evapotranspiration. So we all know that evapotranspiration is a main element of the terrestrial water cycle, but it is also a vital component of the surface energy balance. And just to give you an idea, the Northern hemisphere would be about 15 degrees Celsius warmer if we do not consider the latent heat of vaporization. So essentially that's how much energy is associated with evapotranspiration. And we also know that evapotranspiration can be driven by any of these variables, net radiation, vapor pressure deficit, soil water content, soil temperature, air temperature, wind speed. However, the differential impact of these variables changes from one location to another. And also within the same location, it changes from one season to another. So in this particular study, I was interested to see whether we can obtain any insights into these questions by applying cause and inference methods. So what I did here is I obtained hourly observations of all these variables, as well as evapotranspiration from a flux net tower site in Santa Rita in Arizona. And this is a mountainous shrubland region uh, which is located about 65 kilometers southeast of Tucson. And of course, I carried out a lot of uh, pre-processing, so testing for stationarity and removing seasonal cycles and so forth. And then I applied causal inference methods. And the particular algorithm that was applied here is known as the PC algorithm. So these two figures that you see here shows the causal networks that were obtained at a significance level of 0.05. And the analysis here is divided into two periods. So we have the summer season, June, July, August, and the winter season, December, January, February. If you look at the summer season, um, you will see that evapotranspiration is driven by net radiation, soil water content, vapor pressure deficit, and soil temperature. If you look at the winter, you will see a very similar picture whereby evapotranspiration is driven by net radiation, soil water content, vapor pressure deficit. However, wind speed appears to be a significant driver during the winter. Um, so one thing I did not mention earlier is that these causal networks represent hypotheses, and they need to be supplemented with domain knowledge in order to provide a physical interpretation of why the networks look the way they are. So what I did here is I looked at the seasonal cycle of vegetation cover at the site. And the vertical axis in this figure shows the gross primary production, which is a proxy for the extent of, of vegetation at the site. The continuous line here shows the seasonal cycle average over a period of 10 years, whereas the vertical bars shows the standard deviations. And you will immediately notice that there is a pronounced seasonal cycle in the vegetation cover at the site. And in particular, there is a peak of vegetation during the summer. So what does this mean? Well, it means that during the summer, most of evapotranspiration is coming in the form of transpiration. And this explains why soil temperature is a significant driver during the summer, because it is well documented that soil temperature has a strong impact on regulating water uptake by plants. If I go back to these causal networks here, uh, we still need to explain why wind speed is significant during the winter, but not so much during the summer. And there are two plausible explanations here. Uh, the first has to do with the basic function of wind speed namely clearing the air of humidity and enhancing evapotranspiration. However, because of the North American monsoon in this region during the summer, most of the advected air is humid. And this explains why wind speed is not significant during the summer. But we can also obtain further insights into this by looking at the diurnal cycles 
of evapotranspiration and wind speed. So these two figures here shows the diurnal cycle of evapotranspiration in red and wind speed in cyan. And if you look at the summer season, you will see that there is a significant lag time between the two cycles. Whereas in winter, the two cycles are nearly in phase. And this also provide additional explanation of why wind speed is quite significant during the winter. Now, you might ask whether we would obtain similar results if we use correlation analysis. And the answer is no. Uh, these two figures here shows a heat map of correlation for each pair of variables. And there is a lot of information here, uh, but the bottom line, if you interpret these values, you will get a very misleading picture on the dominant drivers of evapotranspiration and their seasonal change. So this really is a fairly simple example uh, that serves as a proof of concept, but it also shows the potential of using these tools to understand our understanding of evapotranspiration processes. And of course, uh, evapotranspiration is only a single process among many others that we care about in surface hydrology. And this brings up the second study that I would like to share with you today, which relates to hydrologic complexity. So let me start here by posing a few questions. Are wet hydrologic basins easier to model than semi-arid ones? How does the basin size impact the number of parameters needed to represent the response of a basin? And what are the variables that exert the first order control on basin behavior? So the answers to these questions collectively entail what we refer to as hydrologic complexity. So how do we go about answering these questions? Well, in literature, there have been two main approaches to acquire testable hypotheses uh, on hydrologic complexity. And the first is what we call comparative assessment. So in this approach, we utilize meteorological variables, we feed them to a rainfall runoff model, and we obtain stream flow simulations. Once we have the simulations, we then bring in observations and try to assess the accuracy of simulations. And these steps, are carried out over a very large number of hydrologic basins. And then we try to infer the relationship between the properties of basins and the accuracy of simulation. So in the last two decades, uh, there has been a great deal of research in this direction. The second approach is data-driven exploration. And what I'm gonna show you next falls within this category. So this is particularly advantageous because it is a model-free approach. Uh, it is not impacted by assumptions encoded in models. However, uh, one issue that limits its potential is the lack of observations regarding key variables, such as uh, infiltration, uh, interflow, evapotranspiration, and so forth. And the question is, how can we deal with this uh, with this lack of observations. So in this study, uh, I argued that most of the information we are looking for is encoded in stream flow observations. And there are two key points that I would like to highlight here. The first it, is that it is desirable to work with the stream flow observations because it is one of the most routinely measured hydrologic variables for basins around the world. And we know that for some basins, this dates back to a very long time. For instance, we know that ancient civilizations at the banks of the Nile River used the Nilometer almost 3,000 years ago to measure the Nile flow. The second point, and most important, is that stream flow is an integrated measure that encapsulates the contribution of climatic variables such as precipitation the vegetation component, as well as the topography and soil characteristics. So in a way, stream flow encodes all the complex interactions that conspicuously distinguish a hydrologic basin. And this begs the question of what kind of mathematical tools should we use 
in order to exploit the information content of Streamflow. So in this study, I resorted to some mathematical tools that are rooted in chaos theory. And of course, the modern tools of chaos theory are inseparable from the contributions of the famous meteorologist, Ed Lorenz, who back in the 1960s really set the agenda for this field. But the particular theory that I was using here is known as phase space reconstruction. And this is a theory that was put forward in the early 1980s by the Dutch mathematician Florence Takens. So I'm going to be explaining this here to you using the Lorentz system, which consists of three first order differential equations. And by solving these equations for some values of initial conditions, we obtain time series of x, y, and z. And by taking these time series as coordinates, we get this shape, what is known as an attractor of the system. Now, the theory of phase space reconstruction tells us that under very weak assumptions, we can utilize the time series of variable X as well as its lagged values to reconstruct the attractor of the system. And that this reconstructed attractor preserves a lot of the properties of the original one. Now, what does this mean in a hydrologic context? Well, it means that we can use streamflow observations and only streamflow observations to reconstruct the attractor of the hydrologic basin. So this figure here shows the attractor constructed from daily streamflow observations for a hydrologic basin in Pennsylvania. And the coordinates of this attractor consist of daily streamflow observations lagged by zero, one and two time steps. So before we, I go any further here, uh, you might be wondering why are we interested to represent a hydrologic system or any system for that matter in this form? And there are two main advantages. Uh, the first as advantage is that once we have this representation, then we are able to estimate a lot of useful properties of the system. And the second advantage is that we can use these attractors to make forecasts of system state. Now, this figure here shows an attractor in three dimensions, uh, but they are not necessarily three dimensional. They could be in any n dimensions. So one thing we can do um, is to take the same time series that was, was used here and embedded in different dimensions. And this is what is shown in the horizontal axis here. So we take the same time series, we embed it in one, three, five, up to a certain limit, which is taken to be 20 here. And this is what is denoted by E in the horizontal axis, E referring to embedding dimension. And every time we have an attractor, we make forecasts of system state and these forecasts are expressed as correlation coefficient in the vertical axis. And then we try to identify the value of E that maximizes the forecast accuracy. And in the theory of chaotic nonlinear dynamical systems, it is very well established that this value of E is a strong indicator of the number of active degrees of freedom in a system. In other words, this value tells us how many variables are regulating or dominating the system behavior. Similarly, there is another parameter known as theta. And this theta is a nonlinearity index. Uh, and a value of theta that is equal to zero means that the system is linear. As theta takes larger values, then the systems behave more nonlinearly. And similar to what we did with E, we can also take successive values of theta. And every time we make forecasts and then try to identify the value of theta that maximizes the forecast accuracy. So in this particular basin, both values of E and theta are equal to three. All right, now what we can do is construct a two dimensional space where in the horizontal axis we have E the number of active degrees of freedom. And in the vertical axis, we have theta, the nonlinearity index. And we can take the two values that we estimated in the previous slide 
and map them into this two-dimensional space. What we can also do is look at other hydrologic basins. So here we have 400 hydrologic basins across the contiguous United States from the MOPIX data set. And we can take, we can also compute the values of complexity indices for those basins, and here they are. Now, there is a lot of information here. Uh, for instance, one might wish to study the properties of the joint distribution of these two indices or their marginal distributions. But the main point that I really wanna emphasize here is that this provides a framework, a yardstick to measure the complexity of any given hydrologic basin relative to this large cluster of basins. And what is more interesting is to examine whether there are any coherent patterns that link these two indices with the physical properties of basins. So things like the elevation, the slope, the size, and so forth. So what I have here in this table uh, are 14 basin properties. And the table shows the value of Spearman correlation coefficient between each of the basin properties and the two indices of E and theta. So the values that you see in red boxes, these are statistically significant at a significance level of 0.05. So let me show you some of these relationships. In this here, in this figure, we have the number of active degrees of freedom E in the horizontal axis and the basin size in the vertical axis. And you can see that there is an inverse relationship between the two. And precisely, larger basins tend to have lower dimensionality of dynamics. And this corroborates some previous results that indicated the simple nature of rainfall runoff modeling in large basins. Here is another relationship where we have the number of active degrees of freedom E in the horizontal axis and the slope of the main channel in the vertical axis. And you can see that there is a positive Spearman correlation coefficient of 0.32. What does this mean is that by holding all other variables constant and increasing the slope of the main channel leads to a flashy response of the basin and a higher number of active degrees of freedom. And this in part agrees with some previous results that highlighted the difficult nature of rainfall runoff modeling in uh, flashier basins. However, uh, contrary to previous studies that attributed the flashy response to climatic variables, uh, our results here shows that the slope of the main channel is really the main contributor uh, in causing this high degrees of freedom. And here is another relationship where in the horizontal axis, we have the nonlinearity index, and in the vertical axis, we have the IGBP land cover class. And the gradient of these classes from one to 14 represent the gradient in the extent of vegetation, uh, specifically from evergreen forest to deciduous forest, to shrubland, to bare soil. And what does this figure means here is that the presence of vegetation leads to some nonlinear behavior in hydrologic basins. And this is perhaps related to the so-called sponge effect hypothesis. And this is a hypothesis that has been examined in previous papers before uh, and emphasizes the role of vegetation in the presence of nonlinear behavior in hydrologic basins. So the implications of the results that have, or the relationships that I've just shown you uh, is that in the absence of observations in ungaged hydrologic basins, we can use these relationships to learn something about the dynamical behavior of engaged basins. And once we know something about the dynamical behavior, then we are able to extrapolate model parameters from gauge to ungaged basins. And this is a very important task in the issue of prediction in ungaged basins, uh, which is really deemed to be one of the grand challenges facing surface hydrology. All right. So now that we set aside how concepts of chaotic nonlinear dynamical systems can be used to understand the dynamical behavior of hydrologic basins, 
let's see how the same concepts can be used to obtain stream flow forecasts. And if you recall, I alluded earlier to the possibility of using these attractors to make forecasts of system state. Uh, and indeed in hydrology, several papers use the phase space reconstruction theory uh, to obtain stream flow forecasts. However, all of these studies used a univariate time series, namely stream flow observations. And if we have access to observations of other variables, uh, such as precipitation or temperature or soil moisture, then it is not very clear how we would incorporate this information in order to improve stream flow forecasting. So, um, and in fact, this turns out to be a daunting task. Uh, for example, if you have four predictors, and keep in mind that each of these predictors can be used at a different lag time, then the number of possible combinations to construct these attractors is enormous. Uh, and if you do the math, you will find out that for an embedding dimension of six, there are about 40,000 different possible combinations. So this is a very large search space. So in this study, I proposed an algorithm that uses causal inference as a heuristic to navigate this large search space. And the algorithm worked in two main steps. In the first step, the algorithm ranks all the predictors at different lag times according to their causal impact on the variable of interest, which in this case is stream flow. And then in the second step, the algorithm attempts to reduce the redundancy between the predictors. In other words, we try to identify embedding coordinates that are independent of each other as much as possible. So I applied this algorithm for daily stream flow forecasting in nine hydrologic basins uh, across the contiguous United States. And these basins have different physical and climatic properties. Of course, I also needed a benchmark model. Uh, so in this case, I used a deep neural network model of long short, term, long short term memory, LSTM. And the LSTM was chosen here uh, because it has been shown to provide good performance with regard to its stream flow forecasting. So the results that you see in the box plots here in the bottom uh, summarize the performance of the two algorithms with respect to one day ahead stream flow forecasting uh, in terms of different metrics. So here we have correlation coefficient, nash sutcliffe efficiency, and nash sutcliffe efficiency for events above the 75th, 85th, and 95th percentiles. And our algorithm here is shown in red, whereas the LSTM in cyan. Now, if you look at the median of these box plots, you will see that our algorithm consistently, uh, although marginally, outperforms the LSTM. But what is more interesting is when we examine the performance of the two algorithms uh, for forecasting extreme stream flow, both high and low. And this, this box plot here shows the performance of forecasting annual maximum stream flow. Uh, the vertical axis here shows the root mean square error, so the lower the better. And you can see that our algorithm does a fairly better job than the LSTM. And a similar conclusion can be drawn from this box plot, which shows the forecasting accuracy of annual minimum seven days flow. So this improved forecasting capacity uh, is really one of the main advantages of the framework of chaotic nonlinear dynamical systems, because unlike neural networks where the model is inherently tailored to capture the mean behavior, uh, this framework is flexible enough uh, to have a better capacity of capturing the behavior of the extremes. So these results really shows the potential of using um, concepts of nonlinear dynamics, not only to understand the dynamical behavior of hydrologic basins, but also for practical purposes, such as obtaining a stream flow forecasts. So now I would like to move on 
and talk about the fourth and last study of the first part of the presentation, uh, which relates to the relationship between infrared brightness temperature and precipitation. And as a background here, uh, infrared brightness temperature inf uh, observations provided from satellites provide a lot of information on the properties of clouds. And therefore, infrared IR has often been used as an input to estimate precipitation. So the way that this works is that at any given moment, infrared brightness temperature obtained from satellites will be used as an input to some algorithm. And this algorithm will map the information into precipitation. And much of the research work that we carry out here in our research group is concerned with this particular part, namely developing and improving existing algorithms for a better mapping uh, of IR to precipitation. But what I wanna show you here is that if you look at any location in this map and try to plot the relationship between IR and precipitation, you will see that this relationship is nonlinear and quite scattered. And if you look at another location, you will soon realize that this relationship changes from one location to another. So in this particular study, I was interested to analyze the relationship between the two variables uh, across a hierarchy of spatial temporal scales without the need of invoking some of the assumptions that are often encoded uh, in algorithms for estimating precipitation from IR. And this really led me to explore some concepts of information theory. So the particular metric that I was using in this study is known as maximum information coefficient, MIC. And for those of you who are familiar with the basic concepts of information theory, uh, MIC is a modified version of mutual information that is based on Shannon entropy. So MIC has so many desirable properties. Uh, and one of these is that it is a bounded metric between zero and one. So if you have a perfect relationship, even if it is nonlinear, uh, like the one that you see here, then the value of MIC is equal to one. And as more noise is included in the data, then the value of MIC gets lower and lower until it reaches zero for independent variables. So what I'm showing you here is an animation of the relationship between IR and precipitation in the contiguous United States. And bright colors in this map indicate higher values of MIC. In other words, higher dependence between the two variables. Whereas the two panels on the side here shows the value of MIC averaged across latitudes and longitudes. And I want you to pay attention here to two things. Uh, first, the spatial variability in the value of MIC at any given month. And second, I want you to pay attention to the month to month variability in the relationship between these two variables. So this bird's eye view on the relationship between IR and precipitation actually reflects some of the physical relationships that we know quite well. For instance, the strong association between the two variables in the case of convective precipitation in the Midwest and the low association in mountainous regions such as the Sierra Nevada in the West. However, by dissecting this image and looking into different climatic regions across a hierarchy of spatial temporal scales, we are also able to obtain some interesting and new insights into the relationship between IR and precipitation. But what I really want to highlight here is a potential application of this sort of analysis. And the example that I'm going to show you here uh, was carried out using Persian data set. So Persian is a satellite-based precipitation data set that is produced by our research group here at UC Irvine. And um, what I've done here is I took hourly observations from Persian and I evaluated it against um, ground measurements. 
And the vertical axis of this scatter plot here shows the correlation coefficient that was obtained from this evaluation. The horizontal axis here shows the MIC, and this is the same metric that I shown you in the previous slide. Now, the two metrics were normalized uh, such that they are bounded between zero and one. And if you, are, if you assume a relationship between these two metrics, then any point that is located above the one-to-one -one line indicates that the, the correlation coefficient is higher than what would be expected from the inherent information content. On the other hand, any point that is located below the one-to-one -one line indicates that the algorithm is underutilizing the information content of infrared brightness temperature. So in this scatter plot, I color coded all the points above the line in blue and the ones below the line in red. And if we take these points and plot them in the map, then all these regions in red, these are regions where the algorithm is underutilizing the information content. And arguably, the algorithm can be further improved to achieve a correlation coefficient that is at least as high as what would be expected from uh, the value of MIC. So this really highlights some of the uh, practical applications in which this sort of analysis can be used uh, basically for diagnosing and then improving existing algorithms for estimating precipitation from satellites. So with this note, I, I'm gonna switch gears here uh, to the second part of the presentation uh, in which I'm gonna show you two studies that uses satellite-based precipitation datasets uh, in hydroclimatic studies. And the particular data set that is used here is Persian CDR. Uh, so Persian CDR stands for precipitation estimation from remotely sensed information using artificial neural networks climate data record. And this is a satellite-based precipitation data set that is produced by our research group here at UC Irvine. And it provides daily rainfall observations at a near global coverage starting from the year 1983. So the objective of the first study in which Persian CDR was used is developing what is known as intensity duration frequency curves, IDF curves. So what is an IDF curve? Well, an IDF curve is a mathematical relationship that link the intensity and duration of extreme rainfall with their frequency of occurrence. And if you go to this website of NOAA Atlas 14, then you will be able to obtain IDF curves for almost any region in the United States. And if you select this particular location in the state of Vermont, then you will get something like this. So these are the IDF curves for this particular location. And the way that IDF curves are used uh, is that one would typically select a, a duration, let's say two days, and a specific return period, let's say 50 years, and then you will obtain the intensity of extreme rainfall that correspond to these parameters. And then the value of these intensities are used uh, for infrastructure design. So things like sluice gates uh, in dams and culverts in, in highways and other types of infrastructure. Now, in the United States, you are able to go to the website and obtain the data. However, in many regions around the world, this is infeasible. And it is infeasible because we do not have a dense network of rain gates. And even when we do, the, uh, the record length is often short. So this really prompted us to explore the potential of using Perg Persian CDR to develop IDF curves. And remember that Pergian CDR is available at a near global coverage with a high spatial resolution of approximately 25 kilometer by 25 kilometer. So what I did in this study is I started by exploring the types of errors and biases associated with Pergian CDR. 
And I found two types of biases. Uh, the first type of bias is an underestimation bias that I found to be strongly correlated with innovation. And I ended up using innovation to correct for this bias. The second type of bias has to do with the nature of satellite observations. Uh, that is, they provide an area estimate as opposed to point estimation. So the framework accounts for these two types of biases. Uh, and then I applied this framework as a test bed to develop IDF curves over the contiguous United States. And the results were evaluated using NOAA Atlas 14. Uh, so the evaluation was carried out in so many different ways. Uh, and here I'm only showing one of this. Uh, and the box plots here shows the relative error in the IDF curves obtained from Persian CDR expressed as a percentage. Now, if you look at the median of these box plots, you will see that all the values fall between 3% and 22%. Uh, and this is quite reasonable given that record length that we used here, which was about 30 years. And these results really shows the potential of using satellite-based uh, precipitation observations to develop IDF curves. However, I also think that there is a lot to be done in this uh, domain. And uh, I anticipate that in the coming years, we are going to see some exciting uh, results coming out of uh, this type of research. The second study in which Persian CDR was also used uh, has to do with constraining projections of precipitation in the Nile River Basin. And in this map here, I'm showing you the basin, the Nile River Basin in orange. And you can see that the basin extends across 11 countries. And some of these countries rely heavily uh, on the Nile, either for energy or irrigation or some other consumptive uses. If you take into consideration the population growth in these countries, then you will figure out that the, the situation is quite complicated, uh, mainly because the average annual growth rate of population in these countries is about 2.5%, which is more than double the global average. So really there is a lot of interest uh, in uh, how will climate change impact water resources availability in the Nile River Basin. And in order to answer such a question, uh, we often resort to outputs of climate models. So this figure here shows the outputs of 20 global climate models from CMIP-6. And the horizontal axis here shows the year from 2024 till the end of the 21st century. Whereas the vertical axis shows the percentage change in annual precipitation. Now, looking at this figure, you will immediately notice that there is a considerable uncertainty in the projections. And roughly half of the model shows an increase, half of the model shows a decrease. So this is how the future of water resources in the Nile River looks like from the perspective of climate models. On the other hand, here is how the past looks like. So in this figure, I'm showing the mean annual precipitation uh, for the period 1983 to 2014 obtained from Persian CDR. And as I highlighted earlier, this is a data set that is available at a very high spatial resolution of approximately 25 kilometer by 25 kilometer. So in this particular study, I was interested to combine these two pieces of information to come up with a constrained and more informative projections of precipitation in the Nile River Basin. And what I ended up doing here is using a Bayesian model averaging approach. So in this framework, every model is assigned a weight according to its performance in simulating precipitation in the past. And by doing so, we were able to obtain distributions of projections in the Nile River Basin. So here I'm showing you the distributions that were obtained for the two headwaters basins. Uh, 
Upper White Nile and Blue Nile. Now, if you look at the Upper White Nile, you will see that the mean of the distribution is about minus 1.6%. So we expect a slight decrease of precipitation in the Upper White Nile. If you look at the entire distribution, you will see that there is a higher uh, probability of a precipitation decrease. On the other hand, if you look at the Blue Nile, you will see that the distribution is centered around 0%. And there is really a considerable and wide uncertainty. So at a 90% confidence interval, we can see anything from an 11% decrease uh, to 16% increase in annual precipitation. So we really argue here that uh, this type of analysis is more informative uh, when it comes to decision making uh, rather than just taking the ensemble mean of like 20 or 25 climate models. So with this note, I, um, I'm going to conclude here the presentation. Uh, but before I wrap up, I have a few words of acknowledgments. Uh, and this is perhaps going to be the most difficult part of the presentation. Uh, so first, I would like to thank my advisor, uh, Surush Surushian, for what has been really an incredible four years and a half journey. And Surush has been supportive in every step along this journey. Um, so I'm probably biased about what I'm going to say next, uh, but I'm going to say it anyways. And I think Surush is the best advisor that any PhD student can wish to have. And I'm just so grateful that I got the chance to come here and be part of his group. The second person I would like to thank is my co-advisor, my mentor, Fu Nguyen. Wing. Uh, and those of you who know me, you know that I'm very bad at taking pictures. But this one is one of the best that I took uh, of Fu and his beautiful family. Uh, so since I joined, UCI Fu has been a constant source of advice and support. And he was a friend before anything else. So uh, really thank you so much. Uh, and then I would also like to thank Professor Abdin Saleh, uh, who might be in the audience. Uh, and Professor Abdin was my first advisor after I graduated from college. And he guided me through my first steps in research. Uh, so thank you so much. I learned a lot from him. And of course, I would like to thank my committee members, uh, Professor Sue and Professor Georgiou. Uh, so Professor Sue has always been available whenever I would go to his office. Uh, he will be happy to sit for hours and discuss any idea. Uh, so thank you so much. Um, Professor Effie, I regret that I did not have as much interaction as I would have liked. Uh, but your comments, your feedback uh, in my advancement to candidacy exam, as well on the dissertation were absolutely insightful. Uh, so thank you so much. And of course, I would like to thank CHRS family, uh, all my friends at CHRS. Uh, and we had a lot of happy moments during these four years and a half. Um, and I'm really glad that I've been a part of such a talented group of individuals. Uh, so thank you all. And I hope everybody can find themselves in these pictures. Uh, and especially, I would like to thank Diane, uh, who really has been incredibly supportive since I came here. Uh, first day that I came to the United States uh, and until yesterday, uh, she was always helpful. So thank you so much, Diane, for, for everything. Uh, and last but not the least, I uh, would like to thank my family and mom and dad who are in the audience. Uh, uh, so for those of you wondering, yes, this is me uh, in my first birthday. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, mom and dad, for everything. Uh, and with this, this is a reference list for the papers that report the results that I shared with you today. Uh, but if you would like to obtain a comprehensive list of all the references that I used, uh, then you can go ahead and scan this code and you will get that list. So with that, really thank you so much uh, for joining us today and I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have.